In 2016, American Ryan Haynes wrote a deeply personal piece for the Black expat, reflecting on raising two young sons of color abroad. Since 2002, Ryan and his family have lived internationally, with all their moves being within the continent of Asia. As a result, his childhood experiences, being raised by a Black American father and a Trini mother, differ very much from his children, who were born and raised outside of the U.S., and much of that was explored in his initial story. So fast forward four years later, when I catch up with Ryan, who is now based in Taipei, Taiwan. I decided to revisit this discussion now that his sons are high school age, with one prepping to head to college in the near future. With the conversation of racial injustice at the forefront, we discuss addressing racism within the international school context. We also discuss how to bring up the topic of safety and race when choosing your next international employer, as well as when to have the talk with your third culture kid of color if they are considering living in the U.S. for college. Ryan, who is a school counselor by training, offers his personal insight on all of these topics and more in this episode of The Global Chatter. How are you doing today, Ryan? I'm doing well, Amanda. Uh, <laughs> how, how, are you, how are you? No, it's, um, Amanda, it's, it's great, great to see you again. Great to reconnect. Um, yeah, we were, we were just reminiscing prior to this recording that we had first met at, in 2014. In Tyson's yep. Corner, Virginia, yep. at um, one of our favorite conferences, uh, Families and Global Transitions (FIGT), yep. where I where I found my tribe. I, that 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 conference just um, ignited something in me, you know, and, and, and it was spe- and it was special because my mom was there as well. So yeah. I, I, I'm so glad you mentioned FIGT because I think it's a resource that a lot of families and individuals don't necessarily know. And, and well, why I, you, it, why don't you explain it? Why don't you explain it? <laughs> you know, are you going to interview me now? Okay. Uh, so family, <laughs> families and global transition incorporated is this great organization that really is to support not just families, even though that's in the title, but individuals who are in some sort of global mobility. And so w- what is really great, Ruth Van Raken, of course, who is one of the authors behind the TCK Bible. I call it that so much. I actually forgot the actual full name, the third culture kid book. I have it. It's, it's down here somewhere on my bookshelf. Oh, yeah, right. I got it. right here. There you go. Third culture kids. Honestly, if you Google that book, that's the first thing growing up among worlds, right? Um, which she first wrote with David Pollock, right? right, right. And then, um, subsequent editions there's the latest edition that came out she she updated with his son michael pollock um That's right. which is a complete here's a complete sidebar and and mike knows this i met his dad when i was like 16 years old because wow. His dad actually came and spoke at the international school I was going to, and this was right. This is this was the early day of, of of the term third culture kid even being a thing, and I remember his dad came, and he was talking to all of us. I must have been in eleventh grade, and and he started saying third culture kids, and we're all looking at him like, what is this dude talking about? And you have to remember, this is mid nineties, like no one really <laughs> said TCK. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, his 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 father said, you know, you you won't get it now, but you'll get it in a couple of years as you start to go to college and go out in the world. And, right. and sure enough, sure enough, he was right. But I was looking through some yearbook stuff the other day, and there's a photo of his dad, like from 1995, right <laughs> in oh. in there. Because I remember thinking his dad looked like Santa Claus because he was this white dude with like a white beard. So FIGT kind of was like full circle for me when I met Mike. Cause I was like, I, kn- I know your dad, I met your mm-hmm. dad. And, and so it kind of opened me up to, to meeting all the cool people like you um, in you. the process. So, so, all right, so let's, let's get it rocking and rolling. So for the people who don't know, you are currently in Taipei, Taiwan, but before you got there, I want to talk a little bit just about your story. And so can you tell me, where you grew up and, and a little bit about your own cross-cultural background. Sure. Um, 
Well, my mom is from tr the island of Trinidad and Tobago, and my, and my dad is from Toledo, Ohio. They met at Howard University in Washington, D.C. As all good things are, because I was it, born at Howard Hospital. <laughs> really? Yeah. I, I, was, I was born at the Columbia Hospital for Women in, 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 in D.C. And so they met, they met in the, in the mid, mid to late 60s. I came on the scene in 71. And um, yeah, my dad's a chemical engineer for DuPont. So we, we shortly, um, so shortly after graduating, he, um, we, we moved to New Jersey. Then I lived in Delaware, uh, headquarters of DuPont, at least in the U.S., for um, 10 years. And then uh, we moved to Richmond, Virginia in the summer of 1984 when I was 12, turning thir 13. I uh, went to high school in, in Virginia um, and then attended the University of Virginia undergrad and then attended VCU, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, where I earned my master's in count secondary counseling education. And then I always, I mean, and we, and we talked about this before, man, having a parent who was an immigrant, who wasn't from the U.S., I, I always knew there was more to life than just the U.S. I mean, shortly after I was born, I was traveling back and forth to Trinidad to see family. Seems like, uh, and um, so traveling, I love to travel. It seems it's just always been a part of me. And I think just because of uh, I, I did so at, at, at such an early age and just knew there was just more to life um, outside of the U.S. As, as a result, I've always wanted to live and work abroad, but I didn't know how I would do that, especially um, in education. You know, especially, I mean, prior to moving overseas in 2002, I, you know, I worked, I, I'm a public, public school product, proudly, and I worked in public schools as a, as a high school counselor. So I didn't know how I would um, work internationally until I, I met my wife, who actually we were set up on a blind date. Um, and she was in education and she knew about international school education. And actually, that's something that we discussed on our on our first date. She knew about the different job fairs. There used to be a magazine called Transitions Abroad that, mm -hmm. that, that um, had um, international school fairs listed in it. And so um, after living, so I was a counselor in Chesterfield County Schools and then I moved up to Fairfax County where, where my wife or then girlfriend wife was living at the time. And then we, our first job fair, uh, it, we, we uh, signed up with uh, ISS Mm -hmm. And that year, and that year, the, the job fair just happened to be in Washington D.C. You know, so we 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 took the metro in, and we interviewed with a bunch of different schools, and we ended up going to Bangkok, Thailand, which um, um, which is just incredible because six months prior, my wife's brother and his wife ended up getting transferred to Bangkok, mm. and so so this is we're talking 2002. So when we got to Bangkok, we already had family there, and they're and they're actually still there. Wow. They're, 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 they're still in Bangkok. They have two boys and my wife and I have two boys. And so at one point for my mother-in-law, all four of her grandsons lived on the same block in Bangkok, Thailand, which is pretty, pretty random. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we were in Bangkok, Thailand um, for two, 2002 to 2006. Our eldest was born in 2004 in Bangkok. Our youngest was born in 2006 in Bangkok. And then we moved to Taipei, Taiwan in 2006. We were here for, for until 2008 and working at the same school where I worked before, Taipei American School. Mm -hmm. And then we moved to the Middle East, moved to Muscat, Oman, and lived there for five years, um, 2008 to 2013. Living in the Middle East was such a wonderful experience. I mean, such an education, um, historically, religiously, I mean, being a Christian and just being in that part of the world, it was mm -hmm. fascinating. Mm -hmm. And then we moved back to Bangkok, but a different school, international school, Bangkok, um, worked there 2013 to 17, and then now back in, in, in Taipei and, you know, very happy here, hope to be here for a while. So you said a lot, and, and there's some pieces in there that I kind of want to pull apart. So... First of all, it seems like just even your mother's story really triggered that international bug. And I guess not really triggered, it was within you because right, right. she's your mom. How was your experiences, let's, let's stay on that for a second. What was your experience kind of going back and forth between Trinidad? So I imagine you're seeing cousins, you're seeing extended family. Yeah. Are you the American kid? Is it good, positive? Is it negative? Is there a mix of both? Like what was like that? What was that for you as a kid, as far as your own identity? <laughs> It was really cool. I, re I really, I really enjoyed it. It was, um, 
And my family is pretty mobile. I mean, they would come to the States quite, quite often. So it wasn't like they were strangers, especially some of my aunts and uncles. I mean, sometimes I think they spend more time in the States than, than, they, than they do in Trinidad. So, um, but no, it was, it was really cool. And, and, and honestly, it really prepared me for life overseas. Cause when we, when, when my wife and I, her name's Ele- when Eleanor and I moved to Thailand, when I got there, I was just like, this is, just, this is like Trinidad. It kind of just reminded me of Trinidad. And I mentioned that to my mom. She's like, look, you've been to one developing country, you've been to them all. You know, so 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 really those experiences traveling mm. back and forth to Trinidad really prepared me for um for living overseas. I think your mom makes a really good point because I, I remember talking to someone who their background is, I think, Jamaican, and they said the same thing, traveling back and forth between the US to Jamaica kind of prepared them when they decided to do a career abroad and said, you know, there are a lot of things in Jamaica that maybe are not necessarily as developed in the States. And that just got me ready Mm. for wherever I was going. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah, I I could see the connection. And so you listed, and I've always found this fascinating. Has it been intentional on y'all's part to stay in Asia? No, no, no. (laughs) it's interesting, especially so I, grew up in the east coast as i mentioned and honestly asia was never on my or my wife's radar you know i mean as i was telling my eldest last night you go where the opportunities are you go where the jobs are and you know asia was never on our radar but since living in asia in asia and people have to remember the middle east is asia as well middle mm-hmm. east is asia um it's fascinating i mean i mean especially um being an international school educator the, the number of um schools in this part of the world and um yeah and in in terms of um schools that pay well lots of good lots of schools that pay well in, in, in this in this part of the world also but no it was it was never intentional it's just um you know it's word of mouth knowing i mean you know once you've been in once you've been in this circuit for a while people get to know you you get to know people you, you, you know certain schools and you you want to stay at certain caliber schools let's be honest you know mm-hmm. um and and um and yeah we've, we've been very fortunate we've worked at some some very some very good schools and you are i know this but i'm pretty sure most people don't know this listening in you are you've got a counselor education background so you are i, I right now you're more than a school counselor but <laughs> that that's your that was your entry into k through 12 education you're not i mean you do teach but you're a school counselor correct well, actually i um well in terms of teaching i i mean i have an, an advisory but no, I, I'm I'm a counselor. I, I'm a, I'm the direct director of upper school academic and personal counseling, and I'm the grade twelve counselor. See, I always have to say that for those who aren't familiar with the international school setting, and I and they're looking at opportunities because there's so many different ways and so many backgrounds that come in. Yeah. <laughs> and usually, when people think education, you know, the first thing they think of is, oh, I'm going to go be a teacher. But neither you or I are a teacher. We have the same right, master's degree. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. and, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because. When Eleanor, my wife, and I were thinking about going overseas, I thought as a counselor I was going to hold her back because she has she's certified mm. K, K to A, and she has an IT background. Mm. You know, so I remember I remember going to our um, getting well. It was like a preview to the job fair. There was like an, an inf- informational meeting with ISS and, and Jane Larson, who was the head of ISS at the time, who's now the head of CIS. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's become a, a friend and just a tremendous resource. You know, I remember meeting with her and I said, Jane, you know, as a counselor, I feel kind of feel, you know, like I'm going to hold Eleanor back. She's like, Ryan, counselors are sought after internationally, which I which I didn't know. And, and, and so that was so that was really and, and, and that's true. I mean, you go to many job fairs and um, there are actually more jobs, counselor jobs than there are counselors, you know, so. Um, so why, yeah. why do you think that's the case? Um. I, well, from what I've been told from admin, lot there aren't a lot of ex- like counselors with international school experience, mm-hmm. or or schools are looking for either like a spe- specific skill set, kind of like um, or those counselors who know about college counseling. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. spe- especially when I was first getting started. I mean, I remember interviewing at some schools, and they're like, "Look, and once you get some experience internationally, especially with the college piece." let's talk then but now many schools are going to a split model college counseling or personal social or or in my school's case academic and personal 
Mm. Yeah. So does that mean then how, so how do they still fill that counselor need? So like, for example, you're someone who has a counselor degree and obviously you have a ton of experience, but if someone, so if someone's just coming out of graduate school and they're looking at an opportunity, would they be a better fit for that personal academic as opposed to the counseling if they are the college counseling, if they haven't done any college counseling? It, it really, it all depends on, it really it all depends on the school because I mean, okay. I, I give so our first school in Bangkok, Rumerty International School, really, if anything, they, they, they took a chance on me, you know, mm. because I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I had the college background coming from a public school experience in Virginia, but where most school where most students attended Virginia public schools. But right. in terms of, of an international concept, I mean, no, Rumerty was was good in terms of um, providing PD um, mm-hmm. for, for me. And I just I put in a ton of work on my own. I just met with all the reps that came to school, learned more about their schools. And then as I went to different schools, I uh, was able to um, go in on on, as they call counselor flying visits. And, yeah. And, and, and things like that. So, so education on my own, I mean, for my own edification, but also the schools just providing um, professional development opportunities. And let's be honest, some schools are more generous than others. And I've been fortunate to work at, work at some generous schools. So. And since both you and your wife obviously have worked in, in public schools in the U.S. and then since 2002, you've been internationally based. How has it compared being a counselor kind of in both environments? And I know that the U.S. was earlier on in your career, but uh, yeah. I, I, I get that question a lot. And you know what? Um, at least in my experience, kids are kids. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, and I, and I work in I've, I've always worked well, well, with the exception of one year where I was secondary, middle school and upper school or high school. Mm-hmm. I've always been a high school counselor. And, you know, teenagers, they, they want their independence. They want to be taken seriously. Um, they're, they're growing. They're maturing. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they really just want to be heard and listened to, you know, and they, they, they want somebody who's, who's genuine, who's authentic, empathetic. Yeah. You're a brave man for that middle school round because I, whew, middle school's not, not my jam. <laughs> I, high school, I, high school, love them. Middle school, oof, yeah. <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> that's that, a lot. You know, that, that was that was a great learning experience, and that was also before my, and that was also before my own kids were in middle ah. school. But since raised, but you know, <laughs> if I if I were, I would, yeah, I would definitely be a bit of, a better middle school counselor now <laughs> since. Since, my own, having going through this is, since my own children have, have gone through middle school, so yeah. in your own house, so. And you've, re- you've already referenced your sons and the, for, I think, the edification of our audience. So obviously you have a multiracial, interracial family. Yes. Um, your children are biracial. I'm, I'm very curious with your experiences, and I know we've talked about this all, offline. Um, what has it been raising children of color, obviously outside the, the communities that both of you grew up, and even just a reception to you being, in, you know, your wife is white and, and you're mm-hmm. black, um, navigating. Uh, I know that Oman's always a favorite place because there's some, there were some positive experiences, but I'm very curious as you've been navigating and, and having children in right. Asia, what it's been like. Right. Well, well I, I have to say, I mean, in addition, I mean, yeah, Oman was a wonderful experience, um, but really Thailand and, Ta- and Taiwan is also, I mean, <laughs> b- both, both, culture societies that they love kids, they love babies, you know? And so um, um, I, I have to say, yeah, there's been a lot of curiosity, but not hostile. It hasn't been hostile. There's no, it hasn't been hostility, you know, um, for, for which I'm grateful. But I will say this, when, when my fam, when we've interviewed for jobs, especially early on, one of the questions we would always ask the school admin, how would I be received mm. as an African-American male? And how would our family Mm. Be, be received. I mean, it, it's un, it's unfortunate. I, had, I would have to ask a question like that, but but needed to. Mm-hmm. I, 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 and I'll, and to their credit, school admin were honest. I mean, I'm not mm. going to name the school. Yeah. But um, when I when I asked that question back in 2002, the school administrator said, "Yeah, you you may encounter, you know, some prejudice if you if you come to our if you come to our school or come to our or you know our country, which." I, I appreciated that that administrator's honesty. <laughs> the heads you know? up. <laughs> yeah. it, 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 exactly. And I remember when we interviewed for Oman, asking that question, and the uh, 
the admin kind of laughing a bit. They're like, you'll be fine. And then once we went to, we were um, flown in for the interview. Once we went mm -hmm. there to interview and we saw Oman mm -hmm. and well, one, the diversity of the school, it's a school of um, 760 K to, K to 12, 60 nationalities represented. Yeah. It, it, so that was really cool. But the, once going to Oman and just see, it was the first time where my family and I've lived somewhere where the local populace resembled my, my children and myself, which was mm. such, such a wonderful change. And so, I mean, when I would, people just assume we, my kids and I were Omani, especially when we would put on Omani garb, the dish dash yeah. and the coom. Um, I had many Omani um, colleagues just say, look, Ryan, you, you look like one of my cousins. You can be one right. of my cousins, you know? Right. So, so that, so that was a really cool experience. I mean, especially being at based in East Asia for, 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 um, for so long. But the wonderful thing about the Gulf, and, and I mentioned how it's such a wonderful education, you, you can never assume. I mean, just, I mean, the Middle East, you know, it's, it, I know it sounds kind of trite, but it's truly in the middle. It's such a crossroads. You had right. people coming in from all over the world. And Oman is, um, has it, has it, um, oh, a, a seafaring, a seafaring background. So they're used mm -hmm. to accommodating people from all over the world. I mean, Suppose Sinbad the sailor was on yeah. money, you know, and so so they're they're very accommodating, very hospitable, and they're just used to hosting people from all, people from all over. I think you you said something that I hope people really pick on is that as you and your wife were looking at opportunities, you were very intentional about asking questions about how you would be received. Um, because I, you know, I, I spend a lot of time with talking to folks who are thinking about going abroad working for the first time. And I don't think, I, I think people think about it, but I don't think they always necessarily know or feel comfortable <laughs> asking that question, you know, how to word that question. And so mm -hmm. just even in your own experiences, was it just you just as bluntly saying, look, this is the demographic of our family. What, how would it be received at this school or in this country or in this community? Yep. Like how, how, how were you asking that question? No, well, I always tell my students, you want to be in an, especially in regards to, to college or anything else, you want to be an informed consumer, you know? <laughs> and so, so when you're, when you're moving abroad or we're just moving in general, that's, that's huge, you know, and especially when you're moving internationally, that that's enormous. And so I want to know heads up, how am I going to be received? you know, by, by, by faculty, you know, by my yeah. colleagues, how am I going to be received by my neighbor? I mean, anytime we've moved, yeah. I've always been concerned. How is my family going to be received? You know, I, I mean, I was t talking about that recently. We're having some um, discussions on race and diversity and inclusion at school. And I, and, and I said, look, as an African-American male, with a mixed race family, that's one of my concerns. Every time I move, how, how are we going to be received in this neighborhood? You know, so, so yeah, I mean, I'm blunt. I'm very, uh, uh, very upfront. We, I, I want to know, I mean, will this be a good fit for my, for me and my family? Which is a great segue to, to something I wanted to tap on. So about, believe it or not, four years ago, you wrote Father, Fatherhood Abroad, which, so there are a lot of things that come across our site. <laughs> that was probably most received by men more than anything that we've had on our site even up to this day. I was actually surprised the people that messaged me who I hadn't talked to in a while who were like, oh my gosh, that story. And it was men who were in, in very similar circumstances who were living, who, they were black men living outside of their home country, raising children. In some cases, children were bi or multiracial. Mm -hmm. and, and so there were a lot of pieces that you, you, you wrote or, or, or aspects of it that I would love to revisit because so much has happened and obviously we've, we've been talking a little bit about your sons and so you know when you wrote it four years ago i don't think either of your son was in high school yet or if they if one uh, was he was in ninth grade i don't even think it was even at that point no so 2016 they were in grade uh, seven grade seven and grade five Okay. So as someone who just gave their background growing up in the U.S., obviously growing up with, with Black parents and you have a certain perspective as a Black man, in what ways has it been a unique experience or, how, or what type of experience has it been raising your sons outside of a country that you grew up in? So raising your children, obviously we've talked about Asia, so it's very different from the way you grew up in some ways. What has it been for you? And your wife not as stressful 
yeah. I, I, I don't have to worry as much. Don't get me wrong. I worry. I mean, I, I mean, ever since becoming a father, I, you know, just, I'm always thinking about something, you know, and especially raising two young men of color. But as I, as, and we're very, I'm very blunt with our, with our children, with our, with our boys. Um, I, if I tell them if we were raising you in the States, we'd be raising you very differently. You know, like, mm. like for, 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 for example, um, my eldest miles, his best friend lives maybe about a mile down the road and miles will either um, walk or ride his bike and he'll come home fairly. I mean, let's say like 1130 midnight, 1230. And usually for the most part, I'm, you know, I'm up waiting for him to come home. But if we were in the States, there's no way he's coming home by himself, even a mile away. I'm picking him up. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm picking them up. And we're very fortunate here in Taiwan where public transportation is great and it's cheap. Our, our boys take the subway or MRT, as it's called. Mm-hmm. We'll, call, we'll call them an Uber. They'll take a taxi. They'll, for the most part, they ride their bikes everywhere. Or, um, yeah, ride their bikes. Sometimes they walk. So, because um, we, live, we live in the, yeah, we live in the city or in, in an urban environment. Yeah. So, um, a little ways from downtown, and um, yeah, they they love living here just because they have some they have a lot of freedom and independence. But if um if we were in the states, well, for one thing, we'd probably be driving them everywhere. Um, yeah. For 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 for, <laughs> yeah. for one, and and two, there is no way it's two young men of color, especially coming home in the evening, that we would let them come home by themselves. I mean, so definitely raising them d- differently, differently. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you still have the and I'm, I'm completely fascinated by this. Do you guys have the talk? <laughs> you know what the talk, oh, you know, the talk, yeah, the talk. Yeah. Well, I, I think, um, well, I used to, and, I don't write, me, I, 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 please. Let, please. And, you know, we're, we're talking about, let me, let me quali- qualify this because not everyone's American who listens to this and not everyone's true. black American. So true, true. I said it, you knew what I was talking about, but then I realized, wait a minute, not everybody's yeah. going to know this. Yeah. So the talk is a, is a, I almost want to call it a euphemism, but it is the conversation that many a parent of color, particularly black and brown parents or chill or parents who have black and brown children, um, have about safety and, and what to do when navigating this country we call the United States. And, and a lot of it stems from, as, as we've seen, We've seen what's happened with the George Floyd situation, which we'll talk about in a minute, but a lot of it stems from the fact that you just assume you're going to be targeted and you don't want to be caught in a situation. So a good example is you're driving your car and you get pulled over by the police. There is a conversation that black parents in particular and brown parents have with their children about what to do when you're dealing with the police and when you're navigating. And so... I'm I'm curious, obviously, because your kids are American, but they've they've been for almost all, if not all, of their lives yeah. out of the country. <laughs> Do you still have the talk, and what does the talk look like when you're an expat? <laughs> uh, I, my wife and I have two young men of color. We we would be negligent if we didn't have the talk, and it's and it's not just a talk; it's an ongoing dialogue. In, in, in our household. So I think you probably, you know, I write a blog or I used to, I used to write a blog. I mean, I don't write on it as much anymore. And I wrote about having the talk. Um, unfortunately, when my kids were 10 and eight, we were in a, we were back in the States. Um, we were at a department store and this is shortly after the Tra- Trayvon Martin murder mm-hmm. and, and Miles wanted to buy a hoodie. And um and the hoodie, it was just an ugly hoodie. I mean, just regard, just, uh, just just talking about style in itself. It, it was it was just it was really garish. And so, but what it, the hoodie had a skull on the top of it, and it covered it came down to it covered his eyes. And so he we were in the dressing room, and he came in wearing that. And he's like, "Mom and Dad, I I would like to buy this." I just looked at I looked at Elle. She looked at me, and I said, "Now's the time to have the talk." And so, you know, we're in the dressing room and I said, look, Miles, and I start start talking about Trayvon Martin. And I said, look, son, you cannot buy it. We're not going to buy you that hoodie. And here are the reasons why. And, you know, Eleanor just starts bawling. She just starts mm-hmm. crying. Right. And I just and I just tell him about Trayvon Martin and we're wearing a hoodie and the connotations with young black men in the U.S. And um, and my, my boys are very intuitive. Uh, they're, mm-hmm. yeah, they're, 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 they're they're bright young men. And so. He just looked at me and said, "Dad, I'll I'll put it back." He he told he got it. 
He, mm -hmm. he got it. And, and I, I had, and I revisited that recently. A, a friend of mine asked me to send her that, that, that blog post. And that was back in, um, I want to say, yeah, it was 2012. And so she asked me because here's, um, she's a former colleague of mine in Oman, um, white, white female, two teenage boys. They live in South Dakota. And she's like, look, do you mind sharing that with me so I can share with my sons the kinds mm. of things, parents of color, the kinds of conversations they need to have. So I, I, I was really, really flattered by that. But, um, but that, so that made me reflect. I had to have, have the talk with my two boys in a department store when they were 10 and eight years old. That's sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really, that's really sad. And, yeah. but, but it's been ongoing because and if you love your kids, especially your kids, I mean, if you love your kids, you got to have the talk, you know, yeah. I mean, especially if you're, if you're a parent of color, you know, and recently, you know, especially with my eldest, um, getting ready to look at, well, he's looking at universities, going off to college mm -hmm. in about a year and a half, just said, look, I told him the other night, if you go to, because he wanted to talk about getting a car, um, and he's talked about going to the U.S., but that, but believe me, that has now shifted <laughs> oh. <laughs> due to due to the weak response to COVID and the social unrest that's taking place in, in the U.S. Yeah. His, his, his focus on college has definitely shifted, but um, we're talking about getting a car be it in North America, be it Canada or the U.S., and I said, look, as a man of color driving a car, you're going to get stopped. I mean, we, we just talked about this the other night. You will, you will get stopped. You will get profiled. Yeah. Wow. And so if you're having an ongoing conversation, which I, which I know you are with your kids, uh, I would imagine that the summer just <laughs> renewed that, those conversations in full force. And so kind of living in Taiwan, what, what kind of dialogue have you been having with your kids and within your own family, just even after the, yeah. the George Floyd murder? Well, very fortunate that our kids keep up with current events. I mean, they, I mean, lots of times I'll, I'll, I'll bring up an article and they, they're like, Dad, we know about it. <laughs> we, we, we've already, we either have already read it. We've already discussed it. Um, so we're very fortunate that, that, our, that our children keep up or good with current events. But um, I took them to a um, Black Lives Matter rally here in Taipei that took place. Oh, wow. in, yeah, it took place in June. And um yeah, it was it was a great experience, you know, and I'm so happy my my children were able to experience that. I, I was pleasantly surprised that that a, um, that a rally such as that was hosted in Taipei, and I was um, also pleasantly surprised that it was just so well attended and and so diverse. I mean, My Miles was like, "Dad, Taipei is surprisingly diverse," you know, um, <laughs> right. you know, you know, and, and also. Um, I was very heartened and encouraged to see so many of my colleagues and families from our school the rat, rat, that were at the rally as well. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting that morning I was on a, um, a, a, a podcast or webinar talking about the black experience in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. and, um, and what was great about it, so it was like 60, 60 people, um, um, blacks who either currently lived in Taiwan or who had and, and moved elsewhere and, and Taiwanese people, it, it, was a, it was a diverse audience. And what was really neat, many of those people in that call later that day were also at the rally. <laughs> so I, so, so I, got, I got to meet them in person. So that was really, that was really neat. That was really neat. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, so Black Lives Matter rally and there, there have been other, and there's a Black Lives um, Matter, Black Lives Matter Taiwan affiliate or chapter mm -hmm. who has sponsored different events as well that, I, that, that I've attended. But um, but yeah, I yeah we we've talked to the kids about George Floyd. We've talked to the kids. I mean, my wife's really in the politics. We're always talking about politics right. in the house. Um, um, Miles is taking AP U.S. history and AP U.S. government this year, and what a year to take AP U.S. government. <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, with the with, with the election, but also his right. teacher his teacher was a speechwriter for Clinton and Obama. And Obama, so um, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So um, so yeah. So we were just talking about like this like this evening. Eleanor asked Miles, "So what conversation did you have in AP U.S. government today?" And boom, he he shared what was going on. So 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 yeah. So many different conversations. Many different conversations. <laughs> I, I I love what you were saying about the rally because in an earlier interview, um, 
I had a conversation to black men, no and Tony, and they're in the Netherlands. And it was, it was funny. They said similar stuff to what you said. And, and when people go back and hear it, but they, <laughs> um, you know, Tony referenced how he'd never been to a protest, but his daughter, his, his daughter's biracial, wanted to go. And so they they went out and, and they both said, actually, what's funny, what Miles said, where they're like, A, in, in their case, I've never seen this many Black people in the Netherlands. And where did all these people come from? And yeah. so I, I think what's what's been fascinating when I've been talking to expats is that people have been going to rallies and actually been more even more surprised about the communities yeah. they've lived in and went, don't know where you've been, but I'm glad, I'm glad you're yeah. here. Yeah, and so, so my, honestly, my boys didn't have a choice. I said, look, we're going to this. They're like, okay. All right. And then when we got there, they, no, they really enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, to see so many black and brown people, my, my first, my immediate, th- my immediate thought was, where do you all hang out? You know, it was, that was great. That was, that, that was really cool. And then, and then later on, like a few weeks later, both boys play soccer and Miles mm-hmm. was asked to play on this men's league team in this league. And we go out, we go out there and there was one t- and he, there was a team that's made up of all Ni- Nigerians here in Taipei, <laughs> you know? And so. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So, I, so let me ask you this as a parent, you got you got a kid who's going off to college next year. Uh, um, yeah, in a yeah, year and yeah, a half. Yeah, sorry, in a year and a half. half. Yeah, yeah. In a year and a half or so. But as a parent and then as an educator, you know, one of the things that I'm I'm always thinking about my own TCK experiences and that of my friends who are black TCKs is how do you prepare, particularly like a child like yours? for the transition to possibly going back to the United States and, and now you maybe step out of a, a space where maybe your identity has been affirmed and you're going mm-hmm. into another space where it's completely different air sometimes. Like, yeah. are there ways, and I, don't, and I don't know, and I'm not looking for you to have the perfect answer, but I'm just even curious is that how do we, how do, we do that? Because I think one of, the, one of the concerns I've always said, I think with, as an, I am an international school product, I'm not crapping on them, (laughs) but is I think for so long until really the, the unrest exploded this summer, we often assume that we, we like to say we are this United Nations and, you know, we've got this kumbaya moment and we all get along, but there, there are nuances to our identity, especially once we step out of what our international school space. And so how do we even start to prepare kids for you you might be young a young man of color and you're living in new york going to college <laughs> uh, actually that's something that we're exploring or implementing right now um at school because this summer we had so many powerful letters from alumni <laughs> saying saying how they were not prepared they were not prepared, you know, because let's be honest, many international schools operate in a bubble. Yep. You know, you yep. know and so um, be, it, be it the school environment or the city, what, what, what have you. And so many of the alums wrote these really passionate letters this summer just saying, look, here's what, and with suggestions, you know, just here's what you need. <laughs> <laughs> here's, That's always here's, helpful. No, That's always oh, helpful. Oh, oh, I'm yeah. talking, I'm talking detail. I mean, I, I mean, you should, you should see the letters. I mean, very, very impressed. I mean, details about what she, what we should be doing as educators and with a timeline, when you should be doing it. I mean, very, no, very thoughtful letters, very passionate letters. Um, But yeah, I mean, I I know, so for our seniors, at the end of first semester, first semester, we stopped giving exams during, we call it senior week, where we have different different workshops, different workshops, and one of them, um, how to deal with, um, or just ones on microaggressions, or Mm -hmm. things you may have heard in rap music that you should not say, (laughs) 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 when you you get in mixed company, or or, or, or college, (laughs) yeah, 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 so so that's definitely, um, that's one thing we're trying to implement into our curriculum, just about how to better equip Mm -hmm. our students for when they do matriculate to colleges and universities, really not just in the U.S., but really all, all over the world. Because what we're hearing from many of our students is that for the first time, 
mm. they're, they're being viewed as a minority because they've always been in the majority. So mm. let me get, so being here in Taipei, Taiwan, the school where I work is, is predominantly um, Asian, mm -hmm. predominantly Asian. And yeah. so um, Taiwanese American. And so from me, and so they're, they're the host culture. And so for many of our students, you know, they're, they're going off and uh, like, for example, I, I spoke with one alum this summer and he's like, Mr. Haynes, you know, and he, and he's bicultural, Asian, um, Asian and white, Taiwanese and white. And he said, when I was at, when I was at school, people just always saw me as white. And then he goes to school, goes to university in, in Minnesota, which, which is very um, homogeneous <laughs> in, in, in terms of socioeconomic status and in terms of, of race. And for the first time in his life, people, it's like, oh, you're, people are like, oh, you're Asian. He's like, Mr. Haynes, that threw me, that, that threw me for a loop. <laughs> Yeah, he's he, he's he's like I, I he's like I didn't know how to deal with that because for the first time, you know, I am, he was a minority. You know, he was a minority for real, you know? for real. And, yeah, and so, and so, um, so this is something that we're examining mm. at, at our school right now. Where we have um, um, a cross divisional task force, and then we have a divisional task force where we're looking at curriculum and looking at what we can um, implement in terms of um, multiracial education. Um, yeah, what 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 mm -hmm. in terms of in terms of media, in terms of books, in terms of who to bring in, in terms of speakers, things like that. I mean, it's it's amazing to think that now we're seeing such attention on this when when we think about the backdrop, I think of a lot of international schools, typically when students, they typically promote college education and typically the students are going to the US, Canada, the UK, France somewhere in Europe. Some folks, of course, are, are going to Asian universities, but it's really interesting that now we finally starting to have that dialogue about what is the impact when these students are going into these countries? Like, have we prepared them to see themselves, you know, in the context of the country that they're going into? Right. And, and I, and it's true. I mean, I, you know, I, I often, obviously, I'm focused on the Black experience, but it would make absolute sense if you are an Asian student <laughs> coming from a predominantly Asian environment, and then you get to the U.S., and all of a sudden, that's the identity, even though you're biracial, that comes up. And the, and the second part to it, when, when you mentioned microaggressions, I think about how... Um, for lack of a better word, how whack the U.S. response has been to COVID. And, and early on, some of the language that was used yeah, which yeah, it made yeah. it a very yeah. unsafe space for many folks who present as Asian. And yeah. just, yeah. you know, I think about like, and, and the institution I've worked at, of course, we have Asian students and I always, you know, try to check in to make sure that they're getting supported. But, you know, for students who may have never faced that and then come into yeah. an environment where <laughs> political rhetoric, unfortunately, gets thrown into the mix of every other thing, um, yeah. what that means. And so that, that seems pretty awesome that your schools recognized, you know, I don't know if they, did they recognize it before the alumni or, or were they, or did the alumni kind of charge the fire? <laughs> Um, I would say more more so the the latter. Um, yeah. our, our head of school was going to establish a task force prior, prior prior to the alumni letters, but but the alumni letters, wow, they just really <laughs> were, 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 were real catalysts. Were real catalysts. So um, so yeah. But I want I want to go back to something that you mentioned in regards to my own children. I think for my own boys, if they decide to attend university in the U.S., just um. More so, I think they'll probably have more difficulties with, with cultural context. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, we, we go back to the States, I mean, some yeah. year, sometimes twice a year, you know, summer and Christmas. But, you know, they, they keep up, I mean, in terms of sports and music and yeah. they're, close with their, they're close with their cousins. But people are going to look at them and assume that they know certain things, especially being young men of color. And my yeah. kids in, in a very cultural context are Asian. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, especially my youngest son. If he really want to make him mad, wear shoes inside the house. Yeah. You know? um, first you know, of all, like, you don't wear shoes inside West African context. You don't wear shoes inside. Yeah, but yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 yeah. you get you get, you get yeah. what I'm saying. So if anything, um, I think for going back to TCKs, lots of people. I mean, lots of TCKs are hidden immigrants. People look at right. them and assume that they know certain things because they, they look like everybody else, but not until you're in that situation. So, so again, just in terms of things being an ongoing dialogue, 
cultural context and and unfortunately what people cultural expectations stereotypes mm -hmm. talk about all those mm -hmm. I mean, I'm I'm very long removed from graduating from high school, but there's still things that people reference and go, don't you remember this from 1991? And I'm like, nah, I was in Sub-Saharan Africa, dude. I, I know I look like I'm like, I, they're like, didn't you watch it on that? No, don't know the song, don't know the jam, don't know, don't. And that was before I, before the internet. <laughs> so, so I really, we had to, you know, if you wanted to hear the latest music, someone came back for the summer, had a CD, you brought the CD or the tape. And then of course we're listening to it maybe four or five months after, you know, yeah. the U.S. So I, I definitely, you're right. It's, it's funny what people assume that you're going to know when, you just have to tell them, I'm sorry, I didn't grow up here. <laughs> and usually, right. usually, usually they're cool with that. Um, yeah. So ooh, transition. So then. Or, or just ahead. navigating and, you know, or, or just navigating the question. So where are you from? Right. And I know someone's going to say, what, what do you mean Asia? You don't, you, whatever it is you say, they're going to say, you don't look like you're from. Right. Da, 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 da. But, but, but they've come up with an answer though. Um, uh, Miles, especially Miles, is like, look, I'm 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 an American who was born in Thailand. <laughs> there you go. I like. Well, that's pretty. <laughs> yep. Great to the point. Yep. And then, but then the question. Well, I, I feel like the next question will be. So why were you in Thailand? Were your parents in the military? <laughs> is that? Oh. oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because that could be the only reason why anybody goes abroad, especially if you're black. Well, I well, well, it's interesting. And, and first, let me, um, let me say that, um, you know, I'm very proud, appreciate all of our um, men and women in the, in the military. Mm -hmm. um, but but like like you said, I mean, lots of people just assume if you're a person of color, the only way you're overseas is either in the military or if you're in education, you're teaching English, or or I get I get PE a lot. I get PE. A lot. <laughs> Do you and really? It, and it's interesting. And you know, I've been in education for 22 years. I've only met one black PE teacher in, in, in my 20. And so it's interesting that we're talking about this because. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was, wow. so Eleanor, years ago, Eleanor and I had a conversation. We were at her at her dad's, um, on, and he at the time had a had a bed and breakfast. And so, you know, we would we would be there with other guests. And I, the night before, I told Eleanor how how people just assume when I say I work overseas, either military or I'm a, or I'm a PE teacher. And so, we were at breakfast with this family, what white family. And the question came up, you know, what do we do? We said, well, we live overseas, we're in education. No, no, we live overseas. Oh, are you in the military? I immediately, I kicked Eleanor under the, under the table. <laughs> and, then, and then I said, no, we're in education. He's like, oh, do you, do you teach PE? <laughs> I still and don't I, know why PE would be, anyway, I know why. It, but I maybe, know maybe, why. Because of my, maybe because of my build, I don't know. And so, and so I, <laughs> I, I just looked at Eleanor, she just got so angry. You know, <laughs> right. but, but, but but people just make. I mean, I've never had somebody say, "Oh, do you work State Department?" Or um, right? Do you work for a multinational company? You know, um, it's just certain certain assumptions. I was in an elevator. I was in Las Vegas, and I got into a conversation with these two older men, and and they I forgot they said something. I said, "Oh yeah, I live in Doha," and we had this whole conversation. And then the funny part is when I walk out the elevator, I hear one guy say to the other guy, "Oh, I bet she's in the military." And I'm sitting here thinking, "You could have asked me," and I would have very quickly said, "I am not, not military material." Haven't been in the military, but that is such a common assumption, and and which is part of the reason why the black expat exists, right? <laughs> so that there's a conversation that right. Right. black and brown folks and families move across for a variety of reasons, and not just because of of necessarily right. the military. Um, and so I'm I'm, I'm fascinated. You, you know, obviously, as an American, and you just mentioned this. You know, with everything that's been going on, what's it been like looking on the outside in? What's what's been your general view of just <laughs> you're out of the country and there's a lot going on? How's it been? Very well. From from a COVID standpoint, very thankful to be in Taiwan. <laughs> um, 
I, yeah. Taiwan is in a fantastic job managing the virus. We, um, we feel very safe here. As I mentioned, we've we've been in school since April. We we only wow. we were out of we we're out of school twice, um, beginning of February for two weeks, right after Chinese New Year, and then wow. and then for ten days after spring break in March. But we've we've been we were even able to hold a graduation. Um, wow. Outside, a, a socially distance graduation. Um, we started school on time, and everybody. Every, let me repeat: everybody's wearing masks. Everybody's wearing masks. <laughs> that everybody's PSA. Masks. <laughs> you know? And so, um, yeah, because, because and it's been e- interesting culturally, just the Western mindset versus the Eastern mindset. Oh my God! <laughs> now we're just about, you know. Um, in, in the West, well, I should say for the U.S., a lot of rugged individualism. You can't tell me what mm-hmm. to do, blah, blah, blah. Whereas in the East, I'm, people wear masks. Forget COVID. People wear masks when they're sick to protect others. You know, I, I, I don't want to get you sick. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it, it's, it's a respect thing. It's, we're all in this together. You mm-hmm. know? So, yeah. So, I mean, if we want to have school, everybody has to wear a mask. And, every, and everybody does. You know, it's, 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 it's not rocket science. It's pretty simple, you know? Um, so yeah, so from, from a COVID standpoint, very thankful to mm. be, be here in Taiwan. And it's interesting. We've had record numbers of new, new families come to our school this year because, because, ta- because they want to be in Taiwan. Because mm. Taiwan is managing the, the virus well. And because school's in session physically. In terms of the social unrest, um, as we mentioned earlier, I, a part of me, I really wish I was back in Richmond, especially to see the monuments come down to, to, mm-hmm. to be a part of that and, and to witness history. I mean, you know, uh, when I was in graduate school at VCU, I was working um, at St. Mary's Hospital down Monument yeah. Avenue. So I spent a lot of time on Monument Avenue, or as my buddies and I would say, Second Place Street, because all, <laughs> because all those Confederate monu- monuments on yeah. that street and, and, to, and to see them come down i mean especially <laughs> coming, especially coming from richmond that that is especially when back in 1995 when a statue of arthur ash a small statue wanted to be wanted to be put at one end of monument avenue and all the protests and all the racist yeah. all the racism that came out of that to see these confederate mm-hmm. monuments fall by the people and by and, and some by the well i should say by the city but yeah just People there protesting and rally around, rallying around that. It was. I wish I was a part of that. And, and and I think what a lot of people I've had to explain. Obviously, you and I both have ties to Richmond. My family's still there. I've had to explain to folks who've never been to Richmond. So you referenced Monument Avenue. Um, from a history standpoint, Virginia has a lot of those generals buried there because a lot of them are from there, and a lot of you know. A lot of folks were there. It was the capital of the Confederacy. Right. And so, and so, but here's the part that I, I, rem, I knew that, that we were, Richmond was on something. And, and it's when I had a friend visiting from Georgia <laughs> and saw how big, because, you know, some of the statues that have been toppled around the country, like there was one toppled at UNC, you, you know, people could get a crane and, and, and Jimmy rig that thing and get it down. I've told folks, you don't understand that the state and city has to step in. Otherwise, somebody's going to die because folks don't realize that they're on pedestal. Like they're way up there and then they're on these horses. So it's, it's these big elaborate statues, right? Six, six, one, what was it either Robert E. Lee or Stonewall Jackson? Six stories high. Right. So that's not, this isn't when, when, <laughs> when folks are like, what do you mean? Of course, you know, you know, Confederate statues have to come down, but I'm like, but the city actually has to step in because it becomes a safety hazard, which is actually the excuse, which was a smart excuse that they used in one case where they said, you know what, this is getting tagged all the time. People are trying to bring it down. <laughs> Let's just go on ahead and remove it so right. that it's a, it's a public safety issue. And, and if you, if you ever drive through Richmond, like I, my friend was dry, we were driving through and she looked up and went, Good God, even the horses they've got here look regal. Like they've got these generals on top of these things and then these massive horses on these massive pedestals. And so I, I think for me, what I what I found interesting is, and I don't know if you've seen the images, is where obviously when George Floyd passed away, 
Mm. You know, they and they started tagging Robert E. Lee. They started. <laughs> he was murdered. It wasn't he was murdered. I did. I, I, right. He was murdered. <laughs> that they started when they started uh, tagging the Robert E. Lee statue. Did you see where they would like flash the names of folks who had been killed by police brutality? They had like all these different images up there. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like it isn't just the fact that we want to get rid of this this literal monument, but we also want you to remember all the people who have gone through, you know, who have been tortured and who've been killed and have dealt with brutality. And, and, and it, it, I have this photo on my phone that I saved where, I mean, this Robert E. Lee has been tore up, right? Sprayed to the gods. And there's these <laughs> bunch of black kids playing basketball right in the foreground. So it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's a fascinating seen. photo. It's like <laughs> kind of the juxtapose of of yeah. life, and so yeah. Well, at, at the Black Lives Rally here in Taipei, the stage was was covered. There, there was a covering on the stage with the names of all the people yeah. who were mur uh, murdered um, in police custody. Yeah, or at least the ones that we are aware of. Yeah. <laughs> this is because I feel like I'm learning a new story every day. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, as, as someone who's going to be sending kids some possibly back this way, what do you, what do you, what do you think? How do you prepare? How do you plan? Well, well I guess first things first, my, my children have never lived full time in the U.S. I mean, really mm. the extent of their experience has been summer and Christmas breaks. Um, so how, how do you plan? Um, just by having, by having the conversations that we do. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, yeah, ongoing dialogues, being aware of what's taking place in the states, which they're which they're very yeah. good at doing. Um, yeah, just being honest and open. You know, just yeah. just being honest and open. And and for the longest time, especially with with Miles, I mean, I've always preferred my kids didn't go to college in the states for for different reasons. But mm -hmm. but for Miles, and he he brings up a good point. He's like that. You know, I'm a U.S. citizen. Oh, oh prior to COVID and, and George Floyd, he's like, I'm a U.S. citizen. I've never lived in the states. I need to. And I said, son, you're absolutely right. That's I'm living my life. This is my experience. You need to have your own experience. And 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 he's absolutely right. I mean, so I mean, if you if he wants you, that we will support him. I mean, yeah. he, you know me. I I I've identified schools that I think will be a good fit for my boys because that's you know what. What I did for a long time in college counseling. I mean, I have an idea of certain schools, and um, if that's and if that's what they want to pursue in terms of education, we, their mom and I are here to support them. Mm. On that note, I've got three quick little questions, sure. and they are completely non-stressor questions. So don't think too hard. <laughs> I'm calling this the lightning round, so it's. it's I can't just, shut it I, off. I'm always yeah, thinking. Yeah. I can't, I can't I, shut it off. <laughs> These, these, these are some non, non stressful questions, I hope, but here we go. First question. Out of all the places that you've lived, if you had to live there full time again, where would you go back to? <laughs> Your face is like, no. <laughs> where would you go back to? Oh. Right now, this stage in my life was today, September 16th, 2020. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Stay here in Taipei. Really? Why? Um, quality of life, and, and, and it's and mm. being able to live in the city is convenient. National national health. Um, after five years, you're, you're you're eligible to become a permanent resident. It's it, uh, for for a major metropolitan area. It's very safe, um, great and cheap um, public transportation. Yeah. Easy, easy access to the outdoors. Wonderful people. Good food. <laughs> easy win. <laughs> easy win. Wow. But, but, but that being said, I love Bangkok, Thailand. I mean, I was talking to a colleague the other day who we used to, I, there are four, let me see. I have four colleagues on staff currently who I used to work with in Bangkok. <laughs> at the same school and we yeah. were talking recently and Thailand's special. Both of my children were born in Thailand. I mean, I have family in Thailand. Some of the my best experiences as an adult, um, professionally, personally, were, were 
have been in Bangkok. I mean, I've been in, in the country of Thailand. So, um, yeah, I could, I could see, you know, I could see myself going back there. And, and Oman, Oman was incredibly special. I mean, Oman, I mean, the great thing about Oman is like, Oman's like one, it's almost, almost one flight home. You know, it's almost right. enough. Um, and, 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 and again, going back to the fact being in a place where I resemble the local populace, I mean, and you have access to the mountains, to the ocean, to the desert. Yeah, life there was very comfortable. I mean, and all, we've been very fortunate. Every country, life has been very comfortable. So you haven't even answered the question. You kind of answered the question, but you kind of have it. Like you said, Taipei. I should, then I should, go, a, I should, go, I should go into politics, right? I right. You made, a, you made a case for <laughs> everywhere else. Question number two. If you weren't an international educator, what would you be doing? Uh, I would be doing, I would probably be either in Richmond or Fairfax County doing what I'm doing now. So you, you'd, be, you'd still be an educator, you just wouldn't be a rod. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Now, if the question were, if I wasn't in education, what would I be doing? <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, I, I, I'm, I feel very fortunate. I, I feel very blessed. I love what I do. I really feel very blessed to be a school counselor. I, 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 I love what I do. Mm. Last question. Y'all think you'll, you'll stay on the expat road for a while or at some point you're coming back? Um, on the road for a while. <laughs> yeah. Especially, no. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just leave it. On that I'll, note. <laughs> I'll on the road for a while. Don't, don't jinx it. Don't jinx it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but 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 that being said, really depends upon family. Yeah, it depends upon our, our where our kids are going to end up. I mean, but for the for the time being, yes. Here's a completely adjacent question I wasn't even thinking about, but now I want to tie the last two questions in. Would you ever take an international educator gig in the Caribbean? As as a good friend of mine. <laughs> As a good friend of mine has said years ago, be open to all possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. Could be, could, could be full circle once the kids are out of the house. <laughs> could be. And also, uh, Caribbean is it's close, to, it's close to family, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, be, be open to all possibilities. All right. If I see that Trini gig, <laughs> I'll send it, I'll send hey. it your way. <laughs> because there, there is the International School of Port of Spain, which is the capital. And when I was in Oman, actually, I ha- had some families from Port of Spain in Oman because they were, they were pilots for Oman Air. And so, yeah. 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 We'll, we'll check in with you in five years. We, we might find out you've gone to Trinidad and called it a day. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ryan, for your time. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> That's it? I know. We, that's it. No, no. Amanda, almost, yeah. no, Amanda, Amanda, thank you. Very flattered that you asked me to write an article four years. I can't believe it's been four years already, four years ago, and very flattered to be interviewed for your for your podcast. And and thank you for founding the Black Expat. Thank you for providing that, that resource, that medium for for black expats abroad and, and not and, and not for black expats as well. I mean, really just yeah. people want to know more about the black expat experience and just, um, yeah, th- thank you. I mean, I know it's a, I know it's a labor of love. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but no, but I really, really appreciate what, what you, what you do. Thank you. I, I always say it's, it's, it is a labor and it is full of love, but it's always easier because the people who are willing to share their stories make it super easy. So thank you for coming on and, and, and sitting down for the chat. And I am super excited to see what happens next because every time I check in with you, you've either moved somewhere or something else is happening or I've moved somewhere. So true. Yeah, true. The Global Chatter from the Black Expat is hosted by me, Amanda Bates. It is executive produced by Justin Williams. You can find all episodes of The Global Chatter on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you listen to your podcast.